at Duke. Uh, because I've been in education my entire career. I started as an elementary teacher, was a middle school principal, and school superintendent, commissioner of education in Florida, and um, was lieutenant governor of Florida, <coughs> went into higher ed, president of Florida Atlantic University, and chancellor of the state university system of Florida, ended up in Pennsylvania as the chancellor of the Pennsylvania state system of higher ed, which is where I was when I got the, the invitation to join the department. Um, and coming back now as the Assistant Secretary for Elementary and Secondary it was wonderful because it was like going home to me. But the, and so I work with ESSA, as you might imagine, all things ESSA. But I also get to uh, go out into the country and see what people are doing to accept the other responsibility, which is really what attracted me to this, uh, to this um, job, was the idea that you know these children. You look them in the eye every single day. You know their strengths, you know their challenges, uh, and have given greater local control to the state and to the local communities, which is really the embodiment of ESSA, and really what attracted me to the job, uh, is that there's no one size fits all. The people who are in these schools and in these communities are absolutely in the best position to decide how to organize around the necessity to change and then what sorts of changes will best fit uh, the, the, the children in their charge. And um, as I traveled around, I got all the paperwork. We talked with Frank. He recommended this be one of the stops. We started on uh, Monday, by the way, did three visits uh, up into the White Mountains, uh, overnight in Manchester, drove up there and visited three schools. Yesterday, we did two around Manchester and then one down in Nashua. And today, uh, we're out here. We'll do a couple in Franklin, and then we're going to end up um, further south and then head to the airport and fly back tonight. And, and that's kind of customary, three to four days in a state. But more importantly is what, what I really want to do when I get there. Because there's, as I said, these kids, there's 100,000 schools in America. I mean, you can just bounce around like a pinball. I want to see schools that are making change. And I want to see schools that are making change with a direct intent that those changes will manifest themselves in higher student achievement levels. And this is a school that has struggled and recognized it's time to change. And everybody's a part of the change, it's necessity one. You can't have random acts of change and expect to get school-wide uh, response. It has to be all in. And it's so exciting to see how everybody here is participating in the changes that are being made. And then most importantly, as it relates to you all, the implementation of those changes, right? And uh, I said to these folks, you don't need me as a cheerleader, uh, but I can tell you because I've been to a lot of other schools in similar circumstances, have been at this a while, um, this will work. I, and that I know that sounds like a, a very optimistic statement. I also know it sounds like a, a confirmation, uh, but I've seen enough of it to know the, the volume of change you are employing, the kinds of changes that you're making, you will, I'm telling you, begin to see rising student achievement levels. That group of young people uh, in Jason's class is evidence of that. They're buying into these changes. They like these changes. And we know this about young people. Young people who are actually interested in something will do better based on their interests. Surprise, surprise, right? And so all of the changes that you're employing um, are really very exciting. And, and I. First of all, commend you for it, but the other part of these visits gives me the ability to visit other schools that are pondering change and fretting over what sorts of change to make, and in some cases, sadly, whether or not they even want to make change, because change is hard and it frightens people. But I get to talk about folks like you who were facing a significant challenge and you just decided you couldn't do it the same way anymore had to do it differently, and you had to be the instigators of change. And it really is very exciting. I'm telling you, your students are going to be the beneficiaries of that at the end of the day. That I'm convinced of that, especially after having gotten here, been on the ground, and seen a lot of what you're doing in action. You're to be commended. It takes a lot of guts. Good old-fashioned courage to do what you're doing. I mean, I didn't thank for stepping out of the so, comfort zone. Sorry. Yep. So I, I have prepared a bit of a handout. Just I'm not going to read it to you, but I just want to summarize it quickly to give you an idea. Uh, and folks, you do have all a part of it. This is actually something that 
I, pro I did not prepare this for your visit. This is what I prepared for the community in order for them to talk to them and the school board about the changes that the staff has designed in going forward. Uh, so the idea was, change was existing here in the previous school because if you can look, there was essentially a different configuration of the grade levels over the past several years before. So essentially there was change going on. But what we were trying to create as a team is a sustainable model. So we looked at literally a half dozen different ways for us to configure our school. And over the course of time, we took input from the staff, we looked at the different ways to do that, and then that's how we came up with the second page, which is essentially the proposal that we had about academies, uh, dividing the school into two, and the, the, the guiding principles going forward are multi-age multi competency-based classrooms, and I will tell you that competency-based uh, assessments is something that's been in the district for six years? Yes. Several years, so it was already here. Um, the idea of looping, having students have the same teachers over several years, and the reason is is because if they're creating relationships, if, they're, if they want to have relationships with the families, um, those things take time. It's a proven, uh, research proven uh, uh, process. Individualization of learning, having students take ownership, and I will tell you all, I'm proud to say that they saw an awful lot of kids who were engaged in their, their uh, learning uh, in the process and a lot of teachers who are facilitating so that. So much so that when nine people in suits, ties, and dresses walk into the middle of their day, they barely notice. They oh my do gosh. what they're doing. That's the most remarkable example of engagement you can get. It was really something. <laughs> so, and then a couple of things, you don't need to read this, but I just wanted to illustrate, as you can see in this matrix, that the schedule that we got started from 30 minute intervention blocks so the last year we increased the size of our intervention blocks and gave our self-contained classrooms and our family uh, pilot folks some very flexible time in their instruction. And then the bottom schedule is our current schedule and you'll see large spaces of white that say academic instruction during which these teams literally decide who goes where and when, except for the other times. And then at the end of the day, we have kind of an all hands on deck period called STEAM during which all of our teachers have time Classroom teachers, allied arts, special education, and Title I teachers all have time to be able to go and work in conjunction with what's going on in the classroom. And we're building that as we go, but that's one of the new concepts that does it. And then the other thing is, is that we're not going to say that we, I have, this is public information, so we are aware of our test scores. We know what our win-loss ratio is. And we, we, we look at it, we're aware of it, and we're using this as something, as a baseline starting point, and to show the fact that we're not just individualizing our instruction, but we're taking a look at the standardized test of the state, and we're saying if that's the measure that we're gonna be used, we're gonna make sure that we know that test inside and out. And the last page is a two-page document that says, on the very bottom of it, on 129, I'm sorry, on the bottom, as of 10-9-2019, and continuing until 3-10-2020, our teachers have been working with the statewide assessment test, both modular and interim tests, and we have, you'll see the last number on the second page, is 1,867. <coughs> we have administered 1,867 tries at that test, so the at least test, yeah. of the interim and the modular test, and that is, not that we're teaching to the test, but we want to make sure that the kids are familiar with the act, with the process so that therefore they can show what they know and not have the trouble navigating through the test to go through it. Plus, the teachers are looking at the results of those tests and they're getting with the kids to see what they can do to sort of take a look at that. Can I just mention to Frank a little bit of the direction as a state that we're looking at? So we've got our New Hampshire SAS, which is our summative statewide assessment. Uh, we have one 1204 waiver in already, but we're contemplating another one, and this is part of the experimentation, is can we take that SAS and break it into interims? So you've done 1,867 interims, right? Could, that, could we design those interims so you take interims throughout the year and we just add those together to be the summative instead of creating kind of this high stakes and it summative it right. and so right. That concept is getting catchy around the country. There are multiple states that are starting to have conversations about breaking it down into manageable pieces. So this is an evidence of working towards that. I mean, so he's taken our statewide assessment system and they, these educators have designed 1,867 assessments that these kids have been able to engage in. 
So at a certain point, we're like, we've got the capacity to just, like, why would we do this summative when we've been, like, looking at these kids all the way along? Right. So, right. And that becomes our accountability measure for these folks. So. By the way, you want to, what my greatest fear was? I sound like a cynic. I'm not. But I've worked at the local level, the state level, and the federal level. And my concern with the push down back to the states and the local communities was, okay, it's like the little dog chasing the sports car. Now that you caught it, Sparky, what are you going to do with it, right? Uh, and, and one of my reserved concerns about ESSA and that component of it is, will people accept the control and authority that they are now being given back away from a centralized, such a centralized system? Will they pick up the gauntlet and run with it? Will they? Now, instead of asking, having to ask Washington, D.C. for mother may I make a change, will they continue to move forward with change but now approach the State Board of Education, the State Commissioner of Education, uh, the, the school, local school board, the local school superintendent, um, and say, hey, we want to do it in a very different way here, but some of these things require uh, approval because we're flying in the face of the conventional policies, practices, and procedures, and will the people at the state and local level be willing to give it up so that people can do it differently? Because uh, as we know, lots of people like all the little duckies swimming in the same direction on the pond, right? And it gets harder to manage when people are all doing it differently. But again, even within a district, if there are five elementary schools, no two of those elementary schools in the district are the same. And therefore, the changes that might need to be made have to be different to fit the students in those schools. And I give New Hampshire credit, and I'm not being gratuitous. Um, New Hampshire seems to be one of the states pushing hard to try to seek out people who are doing it differently and partner with them as opposed to sitting there waiting to see who's got the courage to ask, can we do it differently? And this district is a good example. Um, not waiting for other people to go first and jump into the pool of change, but trying to get out in front of it. So I really commend you. As you guys know, you're, you're deep into the change process. Everybody has to be part of the deal. You cannot have people sit out the dance. If you're going to make significant change in a school, in a district, it requires all hands on deck to not only be a part of creating what those changes will be, but partnering in the implementation. Where I see most of the significant changes succeeding, it's where uh, the school is also bringing people in as partners, business partners, local community <coughs> organizations, so well beyond. and far more parental involvement and engagement. Listen, if the parents don't buy into the changes we're making, we're gonna have a very difficult time making them. So it has to be all hands on deck, and I love what you all are doing in New Hampshire, but right here in that regard as well, you can tell everybody is on the team for the most part. Can I sign that parents? Heart we, feed, we feed them. Actually though, I want, <laughs> you were saying something interesting. How ask many of them, question. how many times have I heard it though, that people might have said, Enough of this. Just tell me what to do. <laughs> really? You can raise your There may have been those who said, enough of this. Please just tell me what to do. Yeah. So what are you going to say? Well, do we have time for, can I ask it? a little bit of a wonky question, but still talking since we have a federal representative here relative to assessment. Is that a Ask them because I'm Well, because I kind of want to get your guys' input as well as maybe you can reflect on it. We can have a little bit of a dialogue around this when we talk about assessment. One of the frustrations that I have, and I think it's, you can see it in their instruction. They've recognized, given the way that they've structured their instruction, that kids have a span of learning, right? And there's like, if you're putting four, five, and six-year-olds in a class, you know that there's a big, broad span. The difficulty <coughs> is on the accountability assessment, we just capture a narrow slice, right? We go, okay, so we're going to give you a fourth grade assessment. Well, maybe we know that kid's not ready for that fourth grade, or maybe that kid's up at sixth grade. So it's not giving us the kind of information back that we want from the assessment because it's been so narrowly constructed at the federal level. Like, okay, you're in third grade, therefore you take the third grade assessment. Well, maybe we know this, we want to see where this kid is on fourth grade because we already know he has the third grade. Or maybe this kid's in fourth grade, but he's still working on some third grade stuff. We just got to let him mature a little bit. So is there, so I, I 
I'm getting a little bit of positive feedback from some of the indicators over there. If you guys want to lean in on that, no, and maybe I, you can reflect on I've that as gotcha. well. I've and, gotcha, and you're not the only ones. Um, the good news is, is that beginning next year, uh, ESSA is already up for reauthorization. Now there's good news and frightening news there. Um, I don't know what you know about the legislative process, but anytime something is up for reauthorization, anyone who believes, people will just go in and make those minor adjustments to it to make it even better. You can't. When you reauthorize legislation, uh, you open the door to anybody who wants to come in and change it. And one of my problems with DC over the years is, and I'm begging people in Congress right now, when it's time to look at reauthorization, we've got to take it easy. We have we change total packages in Washington, D.C., and I've been there two and a half years, so I have to say we. Uh, it wouldn't be fair to talk about them in another way. Um, my, one of my great fears is that we'll go through the, uh, the very short exhaustion period that D.C. has with change, and ultimately, if you open the door, people will rush in and say, okay, ESSA was fine, but now we want to change it all over again. You've got to give this thing a chance to work. So if there are changes to be made to it, adjustments that we've learned about, we're just now four years old, ESSA. And so um, it, it's still in many ways, if it's not an infant, it's a toddler. Let's keep ESSA, but when changes are recommended, let's make sure they're alterations and not wholesale changes to what people are just beginning to get comfortable with doing. And that is, that is a big concern. Um, I mean, you, you all just went from No Child Left Behind, which I think we can all agree was a monumental change in the way that we did business and the relationship between Washington, D.C. and states and school communities. We were to an NCLB um, PTSD. Yeah, dude, there you go. <laughs> hey, okay. Um, <laughs> and, and so by virtue of that, I think one of the important things the country has to do is create some longer term stability and still be open to making changes that need to be considered to tweak and make it better for people. What have we learned in the first four or five years that we really think by adjusting ESSA, not throwing ESSA out, will make it a better piece of legislation to have a better opportunity on the ground. So. Uh, and those kinds of things I do hear already. So to address what, what uh, Commissioner Audel said, we are aware that you can adjust the interim tests to have a child test at a lower rate. And because it's one of the things that they're worried about data is that if you get a student who takes the fourth grade test and they can't get a single one right, does it mean that they don't know anything or just they would like to be asked questions they, they can answer that they can get right? So we haven't done it yet, I don't think, but we yeah, do. Yeah, it's the, you got it reversed. The modulars are the ones that you can, can adjust. Like drill down. Right. And they're the much smaller tests. Those right. are the modulars. Those you can adjust the grade level to wherever you think the child right. is at. The interim, which is the one that gets reported to the state, is just yes. whatever you don't get to grade adjust level that. they're in, that's the test. And that's get. a good segue. Yes. Can we do this? Because we're, in a minute, his head's going to start. Yeah, yeah. And I, don't want, I don't want to take away from the uh, elementary um, school at no, all. No, but I really like we're, you, yeah, we're yeah. so lucky to have you all here. Can I give you a quiz? And here's the here's the rule of 